Hi friends, welcome back to Common the Chaos Homeschool. My name is Davine and today I'm going to be tackling the topic of homeschooling styles. Now, I am going to go over eight popular homeschooling styles. Do not think that this is all that there is, but these are the eight that I researched for you. And I'm just going to be giving you a quick summary of each homeschooling style. So the first homeschooling style is the one that many homeschoolers begin with because it is probably the most like public school and many of you probably grew up in the public school. I personally was homeschooled more in this style even though I was homeschooled. I would say it was probably more the traditional approach. So the traditional homeschooling approach would be normally you would pick one curriculum company to go with and you would purchase all of the subjects from that one company. So this could be book work or it could be online. I would say either of these are kind of more traditional. So if you're doing book work, you would be getting the English, the math, the language arts, the science, the social studies, and you would be doing things in kind of a structured schooly sort of way. So maybe you would start your day at 8.30 or 9 o'clock and you would have certain school hours. Often the hours are a little bit longer than many other homeschoolers because you're trying to do these subjects completely in a very school-like way. So you might be doing half an hour of math and then 45 minutes of language arts and then half an hour of science and maybe your times would be very scheduled or maybe you would just get through the subjects in a certain order depending on the way you're doing school. So the traditional homeschooler might have a homeschooling room set up, they might have a board at the front, they might have desks for each of their kids, and they might be trying to follow more of a stricter schedule than maybe some other homeschoolers. So if you're doing the online method, it might be similar. You have certain subjects that you do every day for a certain amount of time, and you're just kind of following that program. Another popular homeschooling style that you might hear a lot about is classical homeschooling. So with classical homeschooling, there is a great emphasis on, let me just read the quote here, seeking truth, goodness, and beauty through the study of liberal arts and great books. So it's very focused on classical literature, art appreciation. Many will learn Latin because it is the root of English and many other languages. So that's very common for the classical education approach, you'll be studying just those classics, those classic literature, good literature. So the classical approach also has this thing about the development of the child. It's called the trivium. And so they're teaching children in different ways depending on where that child is developmentally. So the first developmental stage is the grammar stage, and that is between kindergarten and sixth grade. And this is a time where your child is learning a lot of information, a lot of facts. Children tend to have this ability to grasp information at these younger ages, to be able to memorize things through song, through stories, through just rote memorization. So a lot of emphasis in those early stages are placed on that. And then the child will enter the second stage, which is the logic stage, and that is grades seven to nine. And this is when the child is learning how to think logically, is learning how to analyze information and that is what that focus is during those middle years. And then the final stage is called the rhetoric stage. And during the rhetoric stage, that would be grade 10 through 12, the child is learning how to persuade, to argue their points, to think what they think with logic that they've learned and all the facts that they have been thinking about in their brains and they're learning to present that information in front of others. The third homeschooling style I'm gonna talk about is Charlotte Mason. Now this homeschooling style I know a little bit more about because it is more the style that I've been studying and really resonates with me. So Charlotte Mason was an educator in England during the mid 1800s to the early 1900s. And she had some unique ideas about the child at that time. During that time, people believed that the child was kind of a blank slate and you could just give them information 
information and whatever information you gave them would be what they would learn. But Charlotte Mason viewed children as what she called born persons, meaning each child is an individual. Each child has their own unique personality and traits, and each child is going to learn based on what they are born with. So in her style, she would want to provide a feast of ideas for each child so that they can learn many different things, but they can also learn what they're interested in, pick out what they want to absorb. So with the Charlotte Mason method, you are covering many, many, many subjects because you want to give every child the opportunity to grow and in providing a feast of ideas for the child, each child is going to resonate with something and be able to learn about something and gravitate towards certain things. There are a few key parts of the Charlotte Mason philosophy. So the first one is living books. Very rarely are you going to use a textbook that just has dry facts with the Charlotte Mason method. You're going to be using living books. And what a living book is, is it's a book that gives people ideas when they're reading it or hearing it. Ideas are forming in your mind. So often it's story-based because people just tend to latch onto stories much more and personalize those stories. And then instead of giving tests, you will often be asking for narration. So this can be oral narration in the younger grades or written narration as they get older. But narration is a telling back of what the child hears. Now, you're not looking for your child to get certain points. You're just wanting to know what they got from that information. So it is more of a personalized approach and your child is learning to think and say back what they heard. So each child is going to narrate differently because each child is going to receive things differently. The third component of Charlotte Mason is nature study, huge component. Everyone is encouraged to spend a lot of time outdoors, especially when they're young, observing, learning, being curious, touching, exploring. So when the child is young, they spend a lot of time in nature. The fourth thing it talks about is short lessons. So you're providing a huge range of subjects. You can cannot spend a whole lot of time on each subject. So you are spending a few, like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes on each thing, and you're moving through it pretty quickly because children don't have really long attention spans. So you're just building day by day upon what you learned the day before, and you're just keep giving them that little bites of all the different information to provide that feast for the child. Art and music appreciation is a big part of the Charlotte Mason philosophy. So teaching your child to have observation skills in both art and music. Handicrafts are taught. So what handicrafts are, are just useful skills things that they can use to bless others. So learning to use their hands to bless others. So even cooking would be handicrafts, crocheting, we're doing some clay modeling, just drawing, watercolor, those sort of things would be handicrafts, leather working, all sorts of things. And finally, habit training is a huge component of the Charlotte Mason method. And what that means is you're teaching your children good habits that are going to serve them through their life. So Charlotte Mason really talks a lot about developing those positive habits and you just work one at a time and you're trying to make it so that your child can easily do what they should do or what is right for them to do. Because when you have a habit of doing something, it just becomes so much easier. So habit training is one of the key components of the Charlotte Mason and philosophy. Another method is the Montessori method. So the Montessori method was developed by a Dr. Maria Montessori in Italy in the early 1900s. She believed that self-directed learning was the best way for a child to learn and providing the children with different opportunities to learn or different stations or activities and then allowing the child to pick what they want to work on during that time. So she believed that when a child is playing, they are also doing their work. That is their work, their work to become independent independent and to learn what they need to learn in whatever they gravitate towards. So you would be providing a wide range of activities for your child to do and it's very self-directed so the child would pick what they would like to work on during that time. And so the teacher or the parent would not be instructing or lecturing. The teacher or parent would just be there with the child with whatever activity they chose working alongside that child. So in this way, um, getting the manipulatives and the different activities could cost quite a lot of money if you're going to buy Montessori type things. They use a lot of specialized manipulatives. However, 
it is possible, I believe, to make some of your own. So maybe you'd look on Pinterest and see what you want to create for yourself. But if you just go with purchasing the material, I have heard that it can be quite expensive. The Montessori method also focuses very much on the whole child. So you are nurturing the whole child socially, emotionally, physically, and intellectually all at the same time. So a focus on the whole child, not just on the child's intellectual development. Hi friends, editor Davine here. I just wanted to add a few more notes on this method, the Montessori method, and the next method. I was doing a little more research tonight after I had already kind of created this video and I just wanted to insert some information. So with the Montessori method, they are using natural materials, meaning they use a lot of things like wood, just natural organic materials. They don't like to use plastic and things that are not so natural. And that is partially why the cost is a little higher. Also, it does not encourage imaginative play or pretend play as much. It is more focused on real life skills or real life things that will help the child in the future. So not a huge emphasis on the imagination and pretend play, and just more of a focus on those real life skills. And so there's a few more things that differentiate this style from the next style that I'm gonna be talking about. One of the newer methods that I've been seeing is called the Waldorf method. And the Waldorf method seems to focus a lot more on imaginative play and being out in nature and using things in nature to learn. So your manipulatives, you would be out in nature using what is natural, what is in your environment. And then a lot of pretend play is encouraged. So imagination using maybe dress up clothes. So a lot of stories are told in this method and the teacher or the parent would be as much as possible reading stories or even telling stories that they've read just to be able to be more interactive. It seems like when they are studying a topic, it's much more of a thematic sort of study. So maybe you would choose a theme for three to six weeks and then you would try to integrate that theme into all all aspects of their education. So maybe what can you do with math with that theme? What could you do with English, language arts, writing, grammar, science, social studies, all integrating that theme. And it seems like they use a lot of living books as well. They would not be using textbooks so much. And maybe the child is encouraged to create their own books based on what they're learning during school time. All right, so I wanted to add to that. Um, I learned a lot more about the Waldorf method just last night when I was doing some more research. So. I did not mention the big focus on arts, a lot of focus on art and on creative movement and just creating things with their hands. And once again, the natural materials, not using plastics, very organic, everything's very organic. And they're using many of their senses to learn. They don't start formal education until the later years. So I think it's seven is when they start more formal education. It is more teacher directed than the Montessori method. So the teacher is guiding and leading the students in the activities, but the activities are very multi-sensory using a lot of different mediums art, activity, a lot of movement, and the kids are encouraged to create their own books using the information that they're learning and making things very aesthetically pleasing. Another note I wanted to add on here is in my research, I did find some experiences that parents have had with certain Waldorf schools that might have been a bit mystical, a little bit different from their beliefs and their religions, and they did not know what they were getting into when their child joined that school. I don't think all schools are like that, but I just had to put a note in there in case I would hate for anyone to watch this video and then say, oh, Waldorf, that sounds great. I'm just going to send my kid to this school. So please do your research. Um, make sure what the school is teaching lines up with your values. I did not want to take this method out because I think there's a lot of value in the whole idea of imagination and pretend play and just allowing a child to grow through the arts. So I didn't want to take this whole section out, but I also wanted to make sure that my information never caused someone to end up in a situation where they're not comfortable. So please do your research and just take this information as it is. It's just an introduction Please look into it further if you are interested in this method. 
Another very common sort of homeschooling style is the unit study. So the unit study is when the parent will choose a theme or a topic and they will go and create a unit on it or they will purchase a unit from some curriculum company. So it's often based on the interests of the children. So the children have say in what they would like to learn about and then the parent will go and gather items that will go along with that unit. So for example, maybe the children are interested in dinosaurs. So the parent might go to the library and get a bunch of books on dinosaurs. And then the parent might go through the books and decide on the main book that they want to use. And then from that book, they can look at all the chapters and create an outline for the unit study. So they might look at the different areas of the dinosaurs and maybe get more books on the different topics and then think about what kind of activities they could do. How could they incorporate math? How could they incorporate language arts? How can they incorporate social studies or science? And so everything that the child and the parent is learning at that time is based on that one topic or unit and they can go down as many rabbit trails as they want. So that is a very popular type of homeschooling. It works really well with families because you can do it with multi-age students so you can have a wide range of ages while you're studying the one topic together. The seventh style that I wanted to talk about was unschooling. Now you've probably heard this term. It seems like it's coming up a lot. And when I first started homeschooling or looking into homeschooling, I really struggled to try to understand what an unschooler is or what unschooling actually means. So unschooling does not mean that the parents just don't do anything with their children and their children are just left to their own devices to learn whatever they happen to learn. In my understanding, unschooling parents are very intentional in in providing opportunities for their children to learn. What unschooling parents seem to do is they study their children and they see what are their children interested in and they might leave things around the house that their child can look at or pursue if they're interested in it. And so there's this thing called strewing where they might go and get stuff that they think their child might be interested in and they just kind of leave a few things around the house and see what their children gravitate towards. And if their child is interested in something, then they will look and find opportunities for that child to grow and develop in those things. So it's not structured in that the parent is not deciding, okay, we're on this grade or we're learning this thing right now. We got to do this in math so we can get to the next thing, but it's very child directed. So the child will be interested in something. They'll want to learn it and the parent will facilitate that learning in a non pressured way. So they will just provide those opportunities. So some unschoolers don't use any curriculum and some unschoolers do use curriculum but that curriculum would be chosen because the child wants to do that curriculum and the child would be free to do that curriculum at their own pace as they are interested so the child would be learning all that they need to learn because they would know what they want to do when they grow up and they will decide that they need certain skills in order to do that so that is my understanding of unschooling so another type of homeschooler or homeschooling style is the eclectic homeschooler. So what the eclectic homeschooler does is they don't necessarily put themselves in any of these other homeschooling style boxes, but they pick and choose from different styles and create their own homeschooling style. So most homeschoolers probably end up in this category. They like this thing from this philosophy and they like this thing from this philosophy or they like the curriculum from this company or that company and they piece it together to make their own homeschooling style. So no matter which homeschooling style you pick, you're going to be homeschooling differently than every other homeschooling family. There's no way that we can all homeschool the same because our families are all different. We all have different preferences, different schedules, different styles. And so the eclectic homeschooler is just kind of the catch-all for all the rest of us who don't really follow a particular style exactly. So I would say I am more of an eclectic homeschooler as many are. What I do is I pick and choose from the different styles. I do lean Charlotte Mason. I really like the philosophy of Charlotte Mason and I take a lot of the ideas that I've learned from the Charlotte Mason philosophy and I put them in my homeschool but we do not strictly follow the type of schedule that Charlotte Mason would encourage in our homeschool. We like to pick out the things that we like from different styles and piece it together to make what works for our family. 
So I hope that was helpful to you if you're a new homeschooler. If you are not a new homeschooler and you homeschool in one of these styles, I would love to hear from you. Maybe make put a comment below. Tell me if I got the gist of that homeschooling style and let me know if I'm wrong, completely wrong on any of these homeschooling styles. I did my best to do my research and try to present each homeschooling style in the best way that I could. Let me know what kind of homeschooling style you like or you've gravitated towards. I'd love to hear from you and I'd love to have a chat with you. So just leave it in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video and you want to see my next video, which is going to be some curriculum choices for each of these homeschooling styles. So once you have thought about what style or styles you kind of gravitate towards, I'm going to be giving you some curriculum companies or websites that might help you narrow down if you're trying to make some curriculum choices. So stick around if that's something you're interested in. So in planning out the next videos that I was going to do, I was planning on jumping straight into a video that covered all of these styles, the all these homeschooling styles and giving you curriculum recommendations or just some of the more popular curriculums that you can look at if you resonate with any of these styles. However, as I was planning the next video, I realized that I have to do a different video right before I go into the styles. And those are the things that I want you to think about about and consider on top of your homeschooling style before you choose a curriculum. So I'm going to be making a video about things to consider before you even start researching your curriculum, things to think about for your homeschool before you start even looking at curriculum. And then when I was looking at the videos and the resources for all the different styles, I realized what a hilarious mistake I made in saying that I was going to create one video and give you all these resources. There is no way. There are so many many resources for all the different styles. It would be like a two hour video, I think, by the time I'm done sharing. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be creating shorter videos that cover each of the styles. And there are a few styles that I there are a few things that don't really fit in the boxes that I really want to mention as well. So I'll be creating videos for those. So we actually have a new series coming up. It'll be curriculum options for the different styles. So stick around if that's something you're interested in. Give me a like, subscribe, hit the bell notification if you want to be notified when those come up. And thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.